Welcome to the Authorpreneur Podcast, where we talk to authors and business owners about how they are using books to market themselves and their businesses. I'm your host, Chris Green, and in each episode of the Authorpreneur Podcast, we talk to a successful author and business owner to see exactly how they are using their books and author status to grow their businesses and serve their customers. We'll talk about what's working, the benefits of becoming a published author, and we may even come up with some creative new marketing strategies. In this episode of the Authorpreneur Podcast, I talk with Cindy Carrillo, the author of Finding Your Next, When You're Ready for the Life You Really Want. Cindy received her Master of Social Work degree from the University of Denver in 1986 and founded Work Options Group, a leading provider of work-life solutions for employees of Fortune 500 companies. She built and led that company over 20 years until intuition told her it was time to sell. She put the business up for sale just days before the beginning of the financial crisis of 2008, sold it to a Fortune 100 company before the end of the year, and stayed on as its CEO until 2009. After the sale, Cindy used her more than 40 years of business experience, including private enterprise, retail, nonprofit, and government sector work, to start two new ventures, Next Business Coaching and CC Blue Ranch. The combination of these two led to the creation of a new, unique coaching experience called The Immersion where clients join Cindy at her ranch for a two-day deep dive into formulating a plan for the next transformational phase of their lives, what Cindy calls finding your next. And of course, Cindy uses her book and author status to grow her business and help more people. I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. Authorship and all that fun stuff. Uh, so Cindy, great to meet you. Thanks to uh, Nick, author of Rise the Reader. He's like one of the most well-connected people with, uh, with authors uh, and just a great dude all around. He's introduced me to a lot of great people. Um, and he introduced me to you. So here we are on the Authorpreneur Podcast. We'll talk about your, your book, what you're doing, as well as kind of like how you're using your book or how being a published author maybe opened some doors that you weren't expecting. So maybe not a traditional podcast where we just talk about a list of questions. And uh, yeah, it, it's great to meet you and it's, it's great to get started. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So did you self-publish your book completely or did you use maybe like a little bit of a hybrid or how, how did that work? So I did. You know, I, I got to tell you, um, when I first set out to write a book, which was something that um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know where you come up with the decision to write a book. It's sort of like it's one of those things that I think bubbles up over time. I don't think anybody sort of wakes up in the morning and goes, today, today is a really good day to write a book. I think it's something that you ruminate on for a really long time. And for me, it was years and years and years. And I I always wanted to write a book and thought I would have written a book earlier in my career when I started a company as a woman entrepreneur in the 80s. It was kind of different and unique then. And um and I thought maybe that would make a good story. And the reality was I just kept my head down in running a business. And there was really no time. And and I thought, really, is that a story anybody wants to read? So here I am on the other side of, of my career. And um, having built and run a company for over 20 some odd years, sold the company. So I had this lifetime of running a company. And um, and then was faced with a very different period of my life and thought, OK, now I'm a coach. Now I've I've totally reinvented myself from being a CEO to now being a rancher. I bought 35 acres in southwest Colorado. Now I run a ranch and coach from here. And I thought maybe that's a better story. And then you have to go. So I thought maybe I'll do that. And I, I started writing a book and um, one of my coaching clients was actually a, an instructor of writing for people writing memoirs. And, and so I called her and I said, can we switch hats? Can you kind of help me a little bit? And she said, sure. And I started telling her I'm writing a book. She got all excited. Here's how I'm doing it. And she stopped me and she said, okay. I'm going to send you the 10 steps to writing a book that I send my students. And I want you to read it and then call me back. So I did. And I read it, called her back. And she said, what do you think? And excuse my language. I said, I think I've already fucked up the first four steps on how to write a book. 
And she laughed and she says, look, you're a coach. I hired you to help me with my business. You need a book coach. You need somebody who knows how to read a book. And so I ended up interviewing a few people and hired a book coach. And it, well, it, it really did help. And he was the one, his name is Rick Killian with Creative Writing. And, or Killian Creative is the name of his company. And he's wonderful. And what he did was he worked through with me the options for do you self-publish or do you go find an agent and then find a publishing house. And the difference between when I was early in my career, what I've learned is that in order to really go to a publishing house to get an agent nowadays, I sound like an old woman, but nowadays, you need a following. You need thousands and thousands of people on social media. You need a platform. You need, you need to be in that phase of your career where you're going to put it out there and this is kind of, you're going to be multifaceted. And I'm at a very different point in my career where I really don't want to work that. And I want to promote my book and I want to promote my coaching business through my book. So I was very focused on how I wanted the book to work for me. So we decided to go the self-publishing route because I could, one, control the process. I'm a bit of a control fright. And two, I could use the book how I wanted to really work for me to promote the smaller business that I am running right now. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And I hope that anybody who's kind of thinking about writing a book really takes what you just said to heart, because you said a lot of little things that I hope people picked up on. I'm sure a lot of people didn't, uh, but I did because I've been doing this for so long. So when you say I wanted to use my book, Right. So it's not yes. about writing a book and thinking, oh, I'm going to make all these royalties and everybody's going to love me. I'll be a New York Times bestseller. Like, sure, that's out there. It's not realistic for most people. Like, I certainly don't coach people in promising massive sales, but I definitely coach people to say, yes, if you have a book, you now have additional marketing options. And yes, yes. I think you should self publish or at least have some kind of agreement where you control your book and your price, uh, your distribution options, so that you can use it how you want. Because I think there's way more benefit. In the creative aspects of having a book and how you can use it to establish expertise and to use it for lead generation to get in people's hands or just use it not necessarily even as a story. A lot of people think of like, I got to write a story for a book. It's like, no, you can write your own personal story. You can write an outline for a journal. You can write like literally anything. You can have the top 12 questions that you need to be able to answer to graduate from my coaching program. It doesn't matter. It's just paper, right? But having yes. that book on Amazon opens doors. It does open doors. And I think it was a validation of what I know. I mean, I needed to kind of, let me close. I think I needed to validate for me that there was a, a format that I operate on as a coach. People often ask me, you know, like, what is your platform? What is the style in which you coach? And when I started to write the book, honestly, I thought that as, as a business life, you know, pretty well rounded in terms of how I approach coaching, that I kind of just, I was in the moment for every single client at that time, that I really didn't have a, a methodology that, you know, I had formalized that I was following. And I leaned into that. The reality was, as I started to write the book, I realized that I actually did have a methodology, that there were sort of things that I said over and over again, and that there was practice wisdom to who I am and how I work and how I view the world and business and people. And the book gave me an opportunity to encapsulate those things, to identify those things, to organize those things in a way that now I can reference the book in the work that I do. I can leverage the book in the work that I do. And the book now validates 
how I coach and what I do. Because I had to go through the process of organizing my thoughts and formalizing what I know. And I had never done that before. It, it's hard to do. Uh, it's yeah. harder than people think. I, I frequently say that writing your outline is the hardest part because that's the organizing your thoughts. It's putting it in order. If someone doesn't know this topic, what they need to know first, like what needs to be in chapter one before chapter seven, because chapter eight is not going to make any sense if you don't read chapter three. And you have to make all of these little micro decisions and then decision fatigue can kind of can jump in. And then you look, oh, this is a book, this is a massive project. But then a, a question I have for you is like, do you feel that you personally benefited more from that process versus the actual like customers and readers of your book? Oh, it was one of the most awesome things I've ever done. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done because it required discipline and rigor on a level that I had never really experienced before. I mean, I'm CEO of a company. This, this required such self-discipline and having a coach to help me organize my thoughts and motivate me and cheerlead um, all the things that you would hope a coach will do um, and really help you with organizing, you know, what, what is it that an audience, that a reader really wants to learn? Writing is different. And writing a book that is about personal development is different. So the book that I, I, I can I tell you the book that I, I wrote a book? Of course, yeah. It's right here. It's called Finding Your Next. And it's it's because I went through a big personal transformation and really recognize that people are oftentimes stuck and every change in their life requires them to find out what's next. And not everybody needs to go through such a transformation like I did, but I think finding your next is actually code for change. And there are different gradations of nexts, but Hopefully, we have a lot of them in our lives. So learning the process of change, learning how to make decisions, what should you look for, how to determine what's important, all those kinds of things to arm you every time you go through a next iteration of finding your next, I think has value. And I think one of the things that going through the process of writing a book forces you to do is determine the value of the topic that you're writing about and thinking in terms of others and how they will take in the information and what value that's going to have to them. And oftentimes when we work, or when we think we've got a great idea, or we've got a thought behind a book, we come at it really from an internal place. And writing a book, one of the things that it allowed me to do and helped me learn was about how the things that I want to say resonate with others. How do I want them to resonate? How do I want them to hear it? How do I want them to take it in? What does that look like and feel like? So I ended up telling the story of me selling my company and finding this dream, you know, re-resurrecting this dream that I had when I was 19 years old about living in this part of the state and living in a place with a magnificent view and and then the evolution of that dream and that idea and putting it into place. So what were the steps? And what the story gave me was a timeline. It gave me the format for, for the lessons learned. Because we all do learn a little bit better if we tell a story or if we hear it from a story. Humans and I love want stories, yeah. Right, right. I didn't want to write a teachy book. But I wanted there to be lessons in the book. So all of that of how you want to teach or how you want to impart the information to an audience through a book is how do you not learn from that? How do you not like grow up? 
it kind of forces right. you to. And and it's I think hard. it would also kind of reveal that there are multiple ways to learn something. There are multiple ways to to teach a lesson. There, are, you know, different stories will resonate different with different differently with yeah. different people. Uh, so there's no one sure way to do it, which I think could potentially be a stumbling block for people of thinking there's one, you know, how, how do you write a book as if there's like one answer to it? It's like, well, what kind of book, right? If I always ask people, well, why do you even want to write a book, right? Sometimes it's childhood dream. Sometimes I think you know, this, they're going to make so much money and like all the authors are rich. And I'm like, no, very, very few authors are rich, especially not from the royalties from their book. Uh, however, I, I, I keep going down the road of having that book is definitely a fast track, in my opinion, to potentially opening doors that could lead you to making a lot of money, starting a business, getting clients, customers, whatever it might be. Uh, as a coach, it kind of focuses more on the kind of self-help, you know, nonfiction. I, I'm not a fiction guy. I have to repeatedly tell people, like, I cannot help you market your fiction. I can yeah. help you market your other stuff. That's, and that's the easy one. The other one is definitely hard. Uh, I would love to find someone who's really good at marketing fiction, to be honest. That's, yeah, that's, that's a different that's skill set. That's a whole different world. That's a whole different world. You yeah. know, and, and I think, um, you know, it's interesting the evolution of how to use the book. It was funny because when I started, I work with a marketing company called Top Fox. I love them. And I was basically aligning them to this thing is coming. I'm going to be doing this. So let's get our heads around. How do we want to use the book? How do we want to make the book work for us? And I had developed a two pronged approach to coaching. One of which is I do zoom calls and coaching for individuals anywhere, you know, and it's, it's mostly business and, and life coaching. But then to capitalize on what I built here at the ranch, I run an immersion program for two and a half days where individuals, couples, or business partners come, so no groups, and we just focus on them and help them find their next. And it's a deep dive. It's an immersion. Plus, they get to be on the ranch. We, we pamper them and feed them, and it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. We also have miniature horses and goats and pigs and chickens and, and you know, and cows. Any so llamas? You, you have llamas? Or no? no llamas. No llamas. No llamas. Oh, we... um, yeah, no llamas. But really cute animals. So, uh, the cute quotient at the ranch is very, very high. So they get to come here and experience really uh, – a different way of living. So it opens them up to the possibilities. And then we do some pretty one-on-one -on -one intensive coaching. So two different programs. Well, the book is a vehicle for the framework about finding your next that I can have people read and understand what I've done and the process I've gone through and they can then decide for themselves whether or not they want to invest in either kind of coaching program for themselves to find their next. And it has allowed the conversations to be more fruitful, allow them to understand more deeply what I do, how it's done, who I am, because it's pretty brave to come to a place you've never been to for sure. a couple of days by yourself. So this kind of smooths it out, you know, and they get to know a little bit more. When I first started the book, my marketing person, my marketing company, and my book coach thought, okay, you're going to use this book and put it in the welcome basket as a tool once somebody comes here. And it will reinforce what they've learned when they get here. And that was the filter they used about me writing the book and how we would use it. As I went through the process of writing the book, though, that evolved. And then I realized, you know, there are going to be people who can't come here, who can't make that investment, who, because of whatever life circumstances are, they can't even probably afford a coach, but they can afford a book. And so then I realized this was a way to get that process out there to people who couldn't take advantage of the program that I have. 
And yet still we're stuck and still we're trying to find a way to move their lives forward. So it became a little bit bigger than even me and my coaching program. And I realized that I really did want the message to get out there. Because I'm, yeah. So it's bigger. I I love that. And and I think that's maybe something that people aren't kind of thinking through. Like I talked to a lot of people about self-publishing and the power of it. And there's still a lot of pushback. And I think it comes from, if you look back historically, if you go back 25 years, like self-publishing through Amazon did not exist. Self-publishing through Amazon is actually older than I realized. It was like 2003 or something. Like it, it's yeah, been around for a while. Yeah, 20 years old now. Yeah. yeah. I published my first book in 2011. And at the time, I didn't know anybody who'd even heard of it kind of thing. And I remember thinking, oh, great, this is going to be ruined because I saw how easy it was. I didn't really mean to publish. I just kind of had a long document. I was like, what's this self-publishing thing? And now everybody's treating me like a rock star. And now everybody's you know, asking me to keynote their events. And I'm like, I'm just the same so regular cool. guy, but I saw this power of like, oh, the published author status. I was like, okay, but I worried it was going to become ruined because, oh, everybody's going to do it. Everybody's going to have a book. Everybody's special than no one's special kind of thing. I was completely wrong. I say it's more powerful today. Uh, it was than, so powerful. Than it was. In uh, quality. It, much higher oh, quality so, than people so understand. Good. You know, the first few things that were self-published look like, you know. It's full really. color. Full color, yeah, it's, beautiful, yeah. It's shiny, I mean, it's glossy, it's it's inexpensive. It's built into Amazon. It's Prime eligible. It's trusted reviews. It's an open return policy. It's yeah. There's so many benefits that go with it. It allows yeah. people to say, look, I've got this message. You know, I don't know if it's you know for everybody, but I at least want it to be out there for the people who want it. Maybe it's a smaller market, a smaller niche. And they didn't think like publishing would be worth it or like that the trouble wouldn't be worth it if you only have like a thousand readers. I was like, you could have 10 readers and self-publish and true. get those 10 that it's, and they don't have to be super long books. You know, I, I did an article fairly recently because I saw so many people pushing back about like, I need to hire an editor and I can't publish until this. I'm like, for well, most of you guys, it's probably good enough, right? It's probably good enough yeah. to publish. You can always change it. You can always write a new book. You could Everybody's like, oh, well, you know, you only get a first chance, you know, one chance to make a good first impression. I'm like, I don't, I disagree. You can have a terrible first book, but if your second and third books are better and great, no one cares if your first book was bad. You know, and so it's all this kind of misconceptions that are out there about self-publishing as well as what you can do with it. And I, kind of my mission, I mean, like Nick's going to help with it, is just to get people excited about what can yeah. be done. And if you already have yeah. a business, how can you incorporate a book into it? Like in, in what sense? You know, can you use it as a guide when they come to your coaching program? Can you use it uh, as, as an inexpensive kind of lead generation to help people know, like, and trust you before they look at your, your more expensive you know, coaching options? There are all kinds of ways to do it. And then that, again, can overwhelm people, which keeps, honestly keeps coaches like you and I in business. Because I would say, and I'd love to hear your answer to this question. I would say most of the people that I work with are overwhelmed with options and with choices and with, you know, it's not a lack of access to information. They have the information, but they don't know what they need to know. They don't know what's outdated. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know what's old and they're overwhelmed. And they come to me for curation. Like, can you, this is what I want to do. Can you point me in the right direction? I'm like, yes, I can on, on this specific topic. Yes. However, marketing fiction, no, like I'll tell you what I'm not good at as well. Um, but yes, getting started and using a, a self-published book for marketing, yes, I could absolutely help somebody with that. Uh, so curation and overwhelm, do you, would you say your students are similar or, or different? You know, I, I, think, I think that is a, a hallmark of why people don't move ahead on something. And it's funny because I have a, a topic that I go through in coaching, and it's a chapter in the book, which is talks about the things that block us. So the blockers to change and writing a book is a next step is a, is something that takes a tremendous amount of effort over a, a period of time. You have to put some effort into it to make it happen. And I think one of the blockers that um, I identify that you're talking about, it's a couple of things. One is the fear of the unknown. I don't know what, how to write a book. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what the self-publishing world is. I don't understand. It's like standing on the precipice, you know, and looking into a deep, dark cavern, not seeing below. Just, I don't know. 
Well, of course you're going to stop yourself at that point. Nobody's going to step into that and off the cliff. But what that actually indicates is you've got more questions than you've got answers. So go look it up. It's like once, once you start asking the questions of how. So what we do is we say things like, yeah, I really want to write a book. I have a great idea, but I don't know what it would take to do it. I don't know how much it would cost. I don't know if I could self-publish. Boom, boom, boom. So really positive. I want to do this, write a book, but, and the but is the indication of the fear of the unknown. I'm going to stop it and kill this aspiration right up front with all of the reason, all of the questions that I have in the unknowns. So instead of, I really want a book, I have a great idea and I think I can really make this work for me, but we say, and, and I'm going to have to figure out if I should self-publish this. I'm going to have to set aside time to write this. I'm going to have to really organize my thoughts. And and makes it like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to hire somebody like Chris to figure, to help me figure out how to wade through all of the unknowns. The other blocker that gets in our way, quite frankly, is the fear of failure which was a big one for me. Oh my goodness, is this a vulnerable thing to do? For me, I wrote my story. Like who the heck wants to read my story? And do I have a right to put that out there? And do I know my stuff? And what if I don't? And what if people laugh at me? And oh my goodness, what if nobody wants to read it? So there's that unknown and that fear of failure. So what I had to do, and I think we all need to do, is just address the fact that failure doesn't exist if we learn. So this is my first book. And to begin with, I just said first book. It's only after you write a book where you even dare to say that was your first book. Because huh? now you're like, oh, I understand it a little bit more. I didn't really fail. If somebody doesn't like the book, okay, it wasn't for them. <laughs> okay, what have I learned? You know, I can't fail if I put it out there and I put the time in it. There's no failure. All there is, is learning and it's up to me to leverage it and to use it to meet my needs. There's no failure. Right? People are scared of that, that one star review. They're like, oh my gosh. They call it critics math. Absolutely. And, you know, I was... People who like you and who know you, they're all going to write really good reviews for you. And we know that reviews are really important. You know, it's interesting when you set the one-star review. So I got a two-star review. And it was for somebody who honestly did not, like, it just, it did not work for him. He did not, he just put the star, the two stars, but it did not make a review and did not say why. And I'm pretty sure... That, you know, and I thought, okay, that could have been helpful if you had said, well, it wasn't good, but that's okay. I actually felt tremendous relief of getting it out of the way. And I have no idea. So it, but, you know, my response was, oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little bit more balanced now. And I knew it wasn't going to be for everybody. I needed somebody to actually put it out there. So I don't have a five star yeah. on my book. I have a 4.9. Okay. It, it's better, oh. to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you buy stuff on Amazon, right? So yes. you know, you, if you're about to buy something, you look at reviews. And if you see like 1,000 five star reviews and nothing else, we're, not, we're like, no, no, no. They must have bought like 950 reviews. Like, like nothing exactly. is that good. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> so you have to go into it sort of... It, is that mean that I failed? No. No. I, I did great. I did. This is, and I'm now writing the workbook for this, which is funny because two weeks after putting it on Amazon, AI came out with a workbook <laughs> on my book. And I was like, Tell me hey, about man. that. What was your first emotional reaction to that? Oh, my God. I was horrified. I was, I, I took it very personally. I 
I was like, how do I, how do I get this off of Amazon? I felt, I felt like, I guess how you would feel if you got robbed. Somebody went through your stuff. Somebody went through my book and made this false thing maybe, and said, maybe it went through it. They went. They might, maybe they went through it. Maybe they made it without maybe. actually going through it. There was a format that, because there were things in there that are not in my book that are clearly formatted. That's clearly AI. And we've done the research. And it's, the publisher doesn't exist. The authors don't exist. They even wrote a novel about my book. So within two weeks. So what did I do? Well, I got offended. I got angry. And then I thought, okay, why are they doing this? And if they're happening to me, little old me, which, you know, I'm nobody. They're doing it to major authors. Major authors are suing and Amazon and dealing with all that. I hired a lawyer to figure out what I could do with Amazon to get it taken down. And then I realized, wait a second, now I'm spending money and time and emotional effort and all of this for these two stupid little books why are they doing it they're doing it to make money that's all so i went to my network and i may not have thousands and thousands of people on my network but i've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds so i, I went bet to they're them loyal I bet and, they're... They left me and they're loyal so i went to them and i said oh my god look what happened and they were appalled. And it was early enough where this wasn't really out in the press a lot about these books being robbed by AI and, and plagiarized this one. So I said, do me a favor and would you go onto Amazon and give one star reviews and explain that this was not written by the author. So I did it and I said, caution, not my book. This is not my, my thesis. This is not representing finding your next. This is not legit. Don't buy this book. And 50 other people did that on both books. So they've got all one-star reviews with explanations. <laughs> Do you think they're making any money? I don't think they're making any money. Uh, and for the record, I would not recommend... Um, any type of review manipulation. I say this, I agree with you. It's happened to me. I totally understand it. But for the future, especially as someone with a KDP account, uh, I, my advice would be to let it go, as frustrating mm -hmm. as it is. How, because the downside is there, there's, there's little upside and there is a potential downside of red, getting some red flags from Amazon uh, for that. Um, so we didn't. So I think it wasn't like because it was, it was manageable. And what Amazon did do was it, they only allowed reviews if you purchase the material. So right. there was like a, a, after 40 reviews, I think they started to get a little picky about it. So, but what it did do, and I understand that, you know, it was a campaign and we called it the one star campaign. And what it did was it empowered, it was early enough on the AI where this was coming out that my intention was to raise awareness and to say. The other thing that it did, honest to God, is it got me to write a, the official workbook. So now I'm writing the official workbook and I'll publish no. it. Which and will actually sell compared to the other one. Which will sell and which will, and I really will use again to promote my business to be able to offer as, you know, another way to provide access to finding your next to people who can both come here and can't come here for my business and run the audience. So it gives me another outlet. I, I'm so glad that you're already down the road of like, wait a minute, I can make it work for my book and I could use it as marketing. I can use, like, it's a free bonus if you buy Absolutely. this. Guy. That's like kind of the next step. And again, that's a step you can only take if you have published a first book. That's why I say the door is kind of open afterwards. Um, so uh, you probably like received enough feedback on this, on the workbook thing. Like they, it's technically not against Amazon's rules as long as they don't like imply, uh, like, you know, official relationship. They don't use your trade dress or colors, your logos. 
Um, so I know there, there are some like for Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is one of the most popular books where people make, you know, accompanying books to go along with it. It's 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 worse than even being in second place. Like if you're in second place, like if you're only copying who's in first place, the best you're ever going to be in second place. Like you're never going to. No, like, it's true. And I would say, it's please, true. just so much benefit to just making your own book instead of trying to like spot these little opportunities and kind of capitalize them on them. I, I would also see it as a badge of honor to be like, hey, I must be selling enough books and getting enough publicity that that it's worth it for someone to put a little, even if it's a little bit of time and they're using AI. It's like a badge of honor. It's almost worse if like nobody makes a workbook for your book. They're like, oh, is my stuff like completely undesirable? Or like, you know, if someone, like I see people, they say, I saw my book on this Philippine website. And like, I'm like, are they stealing it? Am I losing sales? And I'm like, one, no, you're not losing sales. No one is buying from a sketchy website instead of Amazon. And, and two, be glad that you're you're getting enough exposure that you're worthy yeah. of being stolen. Because it's worse if like, no, I don't even want, I don't even want to steal that. Like, <laughs> I don't even want to put AI on it. No, so it was 2014 or 15. I, I published a book for $300. It was kind of my flagship book. It sold really well. And in hindsight, it was obvious, like, oh my gosh, there's an opportunity here. So someone would download the Kindle. They would convert it to PDF. They were selling my PDF to my $300 book on Amazon on eBay, like eBay.com, like straight up. So that it's was amazing. easy to get taken down. Uh, the, the sketchy websites, I had to like do some kind of like request and the host came in and verified rights and all this stuff. But it, and uh, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have cared because I wasn't losing any sales. But oh yeah. my gosh, I remember that feeling of seeing my mm. stuff, my mm. work that I put so mm. much time into and now it's being pirated and stolen. It, it wrecked me for the rest of the day. I was like, yeah. I am not in a good mood for yeah. the rest of the day. But like in yeah. hindsight, you can kind of see how some of these things work and, and understand, you know, people have different motivations and, you know, um, but there's some things you just can't control. So like, and, it, and I agree with you. It was healthier for me just to let it go and, and write my own workbook. And, and I thought, okay, uh, I will do this. There's, there's value in being able to do that. It gives me momentum to be able to keep it going. I know the topic of my next book now. And, you know, it just, I think, I think writing a book and going down this path and putting something that you do for work out into the world, the lessons that you've learned, the, you know, the, the framework that you've developed what could be bad about that? What could be bad about that? Nothing There's else. There's really just no downsides. You know. And, you know, and I think if people are willing to take the time to gather the information and learn, it's not all that complicated. It's not all that, you know, it's, it's magical and it's a lot of mystical kind of thing until you just, dig one or two layers and understand what the process is to get it work. You know, I did hire a designer and editors um, because I'm a little, I'm a little anal that way. And, you know, and I'm not good at that stuff. You know, I didn't want to be my own editor and I didn't want to do my own design. I, I know what I like but I can respond to it. And I think understanding how to capitalize on the things you're really good at and where you're going to invest your time and where you're going to invest your dollars um, to get something that represents you out in the world. And only you can figure out with that. Oh, I, I completely agree. I, I am a huge fan of the fact that self-publishing is literally completely free. If you have a computer yeah. in Microsoft Word or Google Docs, like you can publish. If you have the budget for it, then absolutely you can hire designers and editors very inexpensively. There are plenty of people who yes. have to work remotely. Like those options are out there. And if people yes. don't know where to go, ask. Join Facebook groups, yes. join communities, ask people. I mean, like I'm, I make myself available. The information is there. It's, it's like if you're standing over that pit, you're looking out, like you can't see it. It's dark and you're scared. It's like if someone come along with a flashlight, be like, oh, this hole is only like six inches deep. Like, exactly. We just, exactly. But they don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> But it watch, really I'll do it first. <laughs> the first time, I, and, and that was a question I was going to ask you from earlier. Is I feel that like it's it's probably built into our DNA in, in some sense to where 
change is generally seen as negative and like, yes. oh, I don't want to change anything, like status quo, things are going well. Instead of like, how can we get people to kind of overcome that and say, change can be the best thing that's ever happened to you. I, I listened to a different author who says like, every time someone talks about a change in their life, he says, congratulations. And it might be someone says, oh, I just got divorced. And the guy says, oh, congratulations. And he's like, why? Yeah. That's like seen as a negative event. He's like, well, congratulations on like whatever's coming next. Like it you, your you. life is changing. Yeah. Yes. And hopefully yeah. that's an, the evolution. I, I look at it, change is opportunistic. You know how when, um, I don't know what your work history has been like, but it's very, very typical for people to, when they're going to leave a job, they have to make it as bad as they can possibly make it to feel better about moving on to something else. So their boss becomes horrible. The work becomes horrible. Their coworkers, everything about it, they become the virus in the company in order for them somehow to feel like it's okay to move on to something else. We do that in our relationships. We have to destroy them to feel better about, I did everything. I tried everything and now I hate this person. So now there's nothing left. Now I can move on. I, I just don't believe that's the way it has to be. I think if we just appreciate that something has given us all that it can for this period and either we've grown out of it or it doesn't fit anymore. Okay. We've grown. Now, how do we move towards something? Instead of always feeling like we have to go away from. And when we go away from things rather than toward them, it's negative, not opportunistic. So that's how I frame finding your next is changes opportunistic. And I've also come to understand that we could be very, very satisfied where we are in our life and still want more. And those two things can both be true at the same time. So I've never been happier in my life. Man, I just eat it up every single day. And I still wake up every morning thinking, what's this? What's this? Right? So that, that's such a great, that's a great way to, to frame the whole thing. I love it. Um, yeah, there's so many, so many roads we could go down on that. It, it makes me think, in, in some of the books that I've written, kind of trying to help people not just see the opportunities of selling on Amazon or, or self-publishing. It's trying to help them, like, how are you guys not seeing this? And trying to, like, kind of put myself in their shoes. And I've come to the conclusion that a lot of people, they, they see their job as something they're not supposed to like. They see their boss as someone they're supposed to butt heads with. Yes. Uh, and your, your work, it, work is something you do only for money. If you weren't getting paid, right. you, would, you wouldn't dare do it. Conversely, everything they do for fun on their free time, the things they enjoy, they're not allowed to get paid for it, right? It's like, well, I'm doing this for free. Like, would someone actually pay me to, to, to coach a sports team? Like, whatever it might be. And, and they just have this fixed mindset. I think it's more like in kind of an American type thing versus, you know, other parts of the world where it's an us versus them. And it's, so it's teams, it's employees versus management. And I'm like, wait a minute, you can find a job that you really enjoy. You can find a job where you feel guilty getting paid. If you want, you're allowed to say, look, this job isn't for me anymore. I'm, I'm going over here. Like when I left my job 18 years ago, the only job I had out of college, uh, it wasn't for bad terms. It was like, hey, I'm making way too much money on my side hustle. And I'm starting to feel a little guilty about how much time I'm putting in there versus what I'm supposed to be doing. So go. I was like, I got, I'm got, i still friends. I still talk to people that I, I work with back then. But it was never, I hate this and I'm going to leave because that's just such a bad, like you're going to take, I've got to believe you would take that attitude to your next job. And then- yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to help people reset this this idea and be like, wait a minute, you're saying that I could write a book and have a purchasable product where I get paid every time it sells, and I can use that to grow a social media audience, and then I can just talk about the things that I actually like talking about, and they feel it's too good to be true. And like, I've I've got people I spent years trying to convince, and I I, I, I try not to convince people anymore because it's a waste of time. However, some people have finally come around when I finally say. I'll give you a short example of a, a triathlete that I was, I, I actually knew back at this job that I used to work at. And he's like professional triathlete. Like he, he's got 50 medals. He comes in first in his age class. Like he knows what he's doing in terms of practice and nutrition and fitness and all this stuff. 
So I finally, I've been trying to get him to write a book or a guide or something. You would do so well with this. And I finally told him, if someone wanted to run or participate in their first triathlon and they had questions, could you answer them? He was like, oh yeah, I could do that. I was like, there you go. And then he was so stuck on, he has to be the best triathlete in the world. He has to write the, the best book that's ever been written. I was like, no, you just have to be able to help some people who have questions. And then he started doing that. And he was like, everybody like thinks I charge too little. I'm like, yes, because you're good. Like you see your value yet. And it's, you know, it's like when you see yourself versus you see other people, like it's so easy to give other people advice. Well, like, you know, it's hard for us to take our own advice. Uh, and it becomes so obvious. And I mean, you can probably hear it in my voice. I like talking about books and self-publishing. It's such an opportunity, not just for like the person who can run a business around it, but for the people that they can help, even if it's only a few people. And in what you just described is that process that most of us don't realize how special we are, by the way. We think that if we know it, everybody else knows it. And oh we don't gosh, yes. accept that as a superpower or as something special. So when it comes to writing a book, like the gentleman you were just talking about, the triathlete, he knows much more than anybody else does or so many people out there. But because he knew it so inside of him and so he just thought it was ordinary. He just yep. thought that everybody else could probably figure this out. Why would anybody want to hear it from me? And I think we come at a lot of things in life with that lack of understanding, if you will, that what we know is not always, most of the time actually, not known by others. And the process of writing the book and organizing your thoughts helps the individual who's doing the writing, like the triathlete, recognize that he knows all of the steps on how to move through this. So for him, it was probably validation on a whole different level <laughs> of expertise than he ever imagined for himself. Oh, if you want to like describe change, like this is a change for him, like this realization yes. of like, wait, yeah. a minute, he got confirmation from his wife, who's also, you know, a, a big, big time athlete. And it's like, oh my gosh, I, I have so much to give. I have like, people can benefit from this. Everybody that I work with yeah. is like super thrilled and happy. And they're telling me I'm, I'm not charging it up. I'm like, well, good. Like you're finally figuring this out. And it's like, so he goes through this change of like before believing this and after yes. believing this. And I like the idea of before writing a book and after writing a book, like that's this line in the yeah. sand of like, I was yeah. not an author and now I'm an author. And like, you don't have to actually, I would make the case that you don't have to even sell any books. To claim yeah. author status, if you've got a book on Amazon, it's purchasable, and you went through that process, I will call you an author all day long. And, and the you'll first get time you're called an author, the first time somebody called me author was an editor, where he said, Hakai author. And I, I just, I didn't know, I was like, it was an email. And I, the complete opposite of like the AI situation where somebody <laughs> like takes my stuff, all of a sudden... It was, it was such a big deal. It was like the joy and the validation and the, I, I didn't need to hear it ever again. But man, that first time, that is just mind blowing. Mind. Is that how you maybe introduce yourself now when people say like, you know, maybe at airports, like, oh, so what do you do? I've started saying author because the Have response you, you get is like, oh, are you? I've never met an author. Are you a famous author? Like, I'm like, no, I'm just a guy who uploads files to Amazon. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll I take just, it. But. I, you know, I should. I should. I don't even have it like on my signature line. I should embrace this much more. Thank you very much. I knew I did something out of this talk with you today. But, you know, it's a hard one to sort of. You know, like the initials after your name, if you get a certification or an advanced degree or something, it's like the first time you do that, you're like, author. Did I really I earn this? Know. Like, a, I don't know. It's a big one. Is a, is a real author going to call me out on this? Like, no, you're a real <laughs> author. Yeah. But it, it has changed. I, I remember yes. when, when I published my first book, it was on Amazon only. Uh, and this is 2011. And back then it was more of, well, you're you're only on Amazon. Right? You're not in Barnes and Noble. It's like like you kind of had to be in Barnes and Noble to be a real author. Today, no. If you're on Amazon only, and I would make the case that it's changed. If you're only Kindle and no paperback, 
I think people are going to look at that and be like, well, you're not like a real author, right? Like real authors have physical books. And I yes. do feel that we're going through another change right now to where it's going to be, oh, real authors have the audio book as well. I was going to ask you about that because that is the next step post workbook because there's an entire audience out there and I'm one of them. That's the irony of this whole thing of writing a book is I'm an audio book lover. And the idea of somebody telling me a story of any kind information in my ears directly to me, just sign me up. I will learn anything, spend the time that way. I would rather do that. And yet I have not recorded my book yet. And are, are, I think are you looking that, over the chasm and it's like really dark and you're like, oh, there's an audio book <laughs> down there somewhere. I don't I know. Started, actually, you know, I do. I think my choices are set up a studio here or go find somebody who does this. And I am, I am of the ilk of, I'm, I got to go find somebody who's going to do all this because technology is not my thing. But again, knowing you who find you a are. Studio. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to find a studio. Yeah, and, make a studio and, or find a studio, someone local. Yeah. I, you know, you're well, obviously you can do anything that you want. There is a perceived benefit of, recording your own audiobook so putting it in your oh, voice I'm, i have to it's my story i have to okay. i have to do it i have to do it uh, right it, it shouldn't as i have never done it Julia myself, Roberts either. just isn't available right now to be me on my book so hey, you know I hold out I'll... hold out hope you know you never know <laughs> an opening could come up but that's becoming the new okay like a kindle paperback book yeah. versus oh kindle paperback audiobook it just audiobook. It, it signals that oh they've invested even more into this book if they're actually yes. like the audio file that versus just the paperback yes um, and, and i've that. heard that that's almost like the biggest revenue driver as well like you actually make, you'll make more money from your audiobook than you will from yes. paperback and kindle as well um yes so yeah i'm glad yeah. that's on your your radar it, uh, it is well. on my list and it will be done this year it needs to be done this year but that's the other thing about those nexts, you know, and finding what your next is. The book is an entree into a whole world of next steps in terms of how do you want to get whatever you want to get out into the world. And, you know, we did design a paperback for my book coach, which was really funny, is he said, it's not really a book unless it's a hard cut. And he was disappointed because I said, yeah, no, I'm not. Because now I have to, do, you know, design that and it's a whole other thing. And I'm not a, you know, people who love the textile of a book. I get that. I get that. I chose not to go down that road and do that. But if you really want to, like, put it out there. That's another option as well. But I think that, you know, the, the workbook for me, the second book for me, understanding how to write the audio book, those are all next steps in a whole new world that has opened up, which is publishing, which is authorship. And, you know, I'm 67 and I'm just entering this world. So honest to goodness, if I could do it now at this phase of my life and my career, I think that should say something to anybody that just, it, it's never too late. It's never too late. It really isn't. You can publish short books. You can, the, the smallest, the, the lowest page count you can publish is 24 pages. That's 12 pieces of paper. Like it's... you can fill it up pretty quick. Like with a title page and a copyright page and a dedication you page. And... Like it's just 12 sure. pages. Now, I wouldn't necessarily use that like from the stage. Hey, come buy my 12 page, you know, 12 pieces of paper <laughs> pamphlet on the side. Uh, but you know, if people understand the process and they say, look, I'm going to publish a notebook or a journal or a coloring book yeah. or a word yeah. search, like you can literally publish anything, of course, as long as you have the rights to it, of course. And then you see that process and you're like, that, that was really easy. That was a title, a description, a price, and two files. That's the bare minimum that you need. And now you have a product page. And I come from a selling on Amazon background. So when I tell people, wait a minute, you have a product page on Amazon, physical product, prime eligible uh, for free. And when someone orders it, you do nothing. And Amazon do will give you a check. 
every month. I mean, and you can do it anonymously if, if you want. They're like, that would cost thousands of dollars just to set up, just to exist, and then buy inventory, and then replenish, and then ship orders. And I'm like, no, forget that. Free physical product on Amazon. When it sells, you get money, and they do all the work. They're like, no, you're lying. That, that doesn't exist. No. <laughs> it is remarkable. It is remarkable when the reports come, or I get these emails saying money is being sent to you. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, wow, I, wow, just today. They used to send paper checks. They would send like eight checks oh. a month. Wow. Yeah. And it was kind They're of fun, but because like seven of them would be like 37 cents and like 84 <laughs> cents. You're like, all the international ones are like really not popping. You get like one for US. You're like, oh, okay, cool. I like that one. <laughs> and then they you went know, all digital. National sale was a friend of mine in Australia. And I, I was like sending balloons up. I thought. <laughs> Yeah, I'm an international author now. <laughs> Did you know, do you have a hard stop coming up? Or? No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, you can actually, because I'm, I'm assuming you've ordered author copies. Yeah. Right? So you've ordered them. So you can actually go to author copies, order one copy, choose Amazon Australia, and put your friend's address in. And Amazon will print it in Australia, and it will charge you like four Australian dollars or whatever they have. Yes. Uh, very comparable to the prices here. And it's this thing that I've, I've found most authors don't realize. Yes, you can order 50 or 100 yourself. You can order one and wow. put it in any of the countries that they're in. They have printers there. So in the U.S., you know, so your book is two, 237 pages. It's black and white, right? Or did you make it color? Yeah, um, the cover's color, but the book itself is black and white. All right, so 237 pages. They're going to charge you $3.59 flat to ship anywhere in the U.S. Unless you're Hawaii or Alaska, it's five fifty five fifty nine. dollars uh, So for like under $7, you can have your book shipped anywhere in the U.S. And it's a similar price. You know, if you use the U.K. or like any you know European countries, they convert it for you, but it's still about $7. And now you're shipping to France without paying $40 per book to ship wow. to France. So you nice. can take orders for anybody that's thinking like, yeah, you can send them to Amazon. That's kind of the easy way. But if you want to take an order yourself or say, hey, if you buy yeah. my coaching package, I'm also going to send you a book package. I'll send you the book oh, and absolutely. the workbook. And that the shipping doesn't go up dramatically. So if you did your book and a workbook, they're going to charge you like an extra 10 cents or something to ship the workbook. So yeah. now you've got like, you know, under $9 to ship two books and you sell, you know, you got your book on Amazon for 20 your workbook might be 14 or 15. So now you got $35 in books that you can fulfill for nine bucks and you can offer them half good. off and you'll still yeah. make money on it. Um, and you could give I the Kindle. That. Yeah, there's using author copies to fulfill orders is very underutilized. The only flaw is they generally are printed last. So they're going to print like prime orders first. These are not prime eligible. Uh, so sometimes it will have a little bit of a lead time. So if you're making like a shipping guarantee, but just you know, make sure it's either on time or, of course, order your own books and you can ship them out. Uh, would you like to hear how you can give your Kindle version away? I would love to hear how I can use my Kindle version more effectively and give it away. Yes. So I, I looked. I don't know if you realize uh, there's a site called Keepa, K-E-E-P-A dot com. And Amazon sellers use it to track prices and track sales so they can see, like, how, how well does this item sell at Christmas time? Or, you know, what, what's the historical pricing on this item? Has it, you know, normally been higher or lower? And they're also designed for consumers. So you can say, hey, this item is 400 bucks. Has it ever been lower? How recently has it been lower? Can I, I'll set up a price alert. Let me know. Next time it's at $300 and I'll buy it. You know, consumer type stuff. But also keeps track of sales ranks as well as the prices on Kindle items. So I can see if you've ever dropped your price on your Kindle book. Uh, which you kind of did. You had it at nine ninety nine when you started, then mm -hmm. eight forty nine. Ever since for two hundred and nine days. But since you're the author, you can actually drop price to ninety nine cents, either through a countdown deal or just lower the price. And then and it doesn't work on mobile. You have to do this on desktop. If you scroll down a little bit underneath the buy box where you can buy it, like the orange button, you can buy it for other people. Oh, and if you buy it for other people, you could put in a hundred email addresses of your friends and they will send out a link for you or you say no i want the links and you just say look you check the button and then if you buy 100 copies it'll be 99 bucks amazon will then give you a hundred individual unique redemption links for your book your kindle book now let the book go back up to 849 or 999 wherever you want and you've basically just bought a thousand dollars worth of books for 99 bucks and now and i think your book is it 
I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you'd like to get your book in, in lots of people's hands, but it's maybe not a book that you're just trying to get in everybody's hands, like a super wide marketing campaign. But you could say maybe on LinkedIn, like, hey, I wrote this book. If you'd like a copy, I'd be happy to give you a Kindle version. Absolutely free. It's $10 on Amazon, but I'll give you a link for free. People say yes. Now you have their email address if, if they're opting into something. And you send them a $10 gift. And they're like, they can look on Amazon. This thing is 10 bucks, but it only costs yeah. you 99 cents. So you're able to, yeah. and you as the author are able to leverage this as well as monitor other people's books. So if there's like a complimentary book and you can look, oh, once a quarter, they drop it to 99 cents. Let me know next time it does. I'm going to buy 100 copies of Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I'll give that to my email list. I'll give that as a lead magnet. Yeah. And it's this very underutilized, like the difference, What's the margin. The that's, okay. You only need Keepa just to kind of look at historical prices. Okay. K-E-E-P-A. Okay, yeah. I got it. Okay. The rest of it is all controlled in your Amazon account. And like you could pay full price if you wanted to buy Kindle versions for everybody else. But then you're going to have to pay the fees. You'll get the royalties on the back end. And I'm still testing it, but I think you actually it qualifies as a sale. And I think they could actually leave a verified review if you gift yeah. them that version. So when they redeem it, uh, I believe it counts as a sale. I'm, I'm still verifying that. Um, okay. But in your account, you'll see if it's been redeemed. So you, yeah, you, know, if you yeah, gave a yeah. link to somebody 14 days ago and they never cashed it in. You can like, I'm going to give it to somebody else. Like if you're not going, so yeah. the, there's no waste, you know, you're not like buying all these right. books and then no one cashes them in and you That's can awesome. even return them up to 60 days later. You're like, yeah, just uh -huh. give my money back on these. I don't need these. But it, to me, it's just such an amazing and powerful lead magnet or just to get attention. Look, Hey, my books on Amazon is 10 bucks. I will literally give you a copy. Like if you're on a stage speaking somewhere, it's like, Hey, yeah. Kindle books for everybody who's here. And they're like, dang, there's like 300 people here. And that's 10 bucks each. This crazy lady just gave away $3,000 worth of books. And you can be like, what's up? That's, that's how I do it. I give away $3,000. But no, you're going to give away like 150, right? Like yeah. half the people will actually cash it in. It's going to cost you nine, like 150 bucks. But you get the benefit of like, did you see that silly yeah. lady? She gave away $3,000 worth of books. And it's, you know, you're not, you're not lying, but it's like, hey, if that's what they're thinking, I'm not going to. I'm not going to yeah. jump in and correct them and explain the marketing strategy behind it. You know, yeah. um, there's some fun things that you can do. So I'm glad you're like actually self-published and not, I, I talked to authors who are stuck in these hybrid publishing contracts. They can't control yeah. their own Kindle price. I'm like, it just limits some of the things that they can do. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's but, great. That's great. I will look into that for sure. I love yeah, giving play around with it. I love giving yeah, it. Especially if it doesn't cost anything, right? Because like, yeah. I think you're like you want your information out there. That's one reason you wrote the book. That's it's like, good. hey, if I can help, I don't need your money. Like I'm not doing it. Like I'll only tell you if you give me a hundred dollars. It's like, no, but you gotta be able to buy the book, you know. So it, it does bring the cost down, you know, significantly. And if you go yeah. free, I got like a love hate relationship with free because I would love to give stuff for free. But if it's free, no one cares. And no one values yeah. it. And they think it's a, a hook or a scam or something and i'm like no you yeah. just have my book for free but if they pay for it well guess what now they're at least going to read it so no, that's true. That, that helps in a sense um absolutely absolutely i'd love that's for you to have the chance to let people know like uh like who is the ideal like potential client like not just like a, like a reader for your book who's going through maybe some life changes and stages of their life but all the way to uh like your your personal come to your ranch coaching program like who is the ideal candidate for that like what do they have going on in their life where they're like oh my gosh my life would be so much better if i could sit down with someone with cindy's experience thank you i appreciate the opportunity the you know i think the number one is that they're kind of stuck they know that they want to move forward but they just don't know how or where or what they don't know the direction they they're kind of paralyzed you had said it earlier in the podcast about how there are so many options out there and that options can cause paralysis and i think for the people who benefit the most from um coaching through the immersion at cc blue ranch here to find their next are people at any age i've got young people early in their career who really are just overwhelmed by the possibilities who don't know how to step in next to somebody who's been in the first or second jobs in their careers and they're like oh, i don't 
where do I go from here? How do I leverage this? What's uh, This is not the life that I set up for myself. I'm stuck. I want to make some good choices to someone all the way through who's maybe mastered what they've done in life. Maybe they've been a stay-at-home mom. Maybe they've um, they really want to change careers. You know, I get a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers I work with who don't want a lawyer anymore and are really wondering how to capitalize on their skills all the way up to somebody who's had a full life and they're trying to figure out really what's next. And that buzzword, that really full, you know, loaded word called retirement. And how do I look ahead to that? And what does that look like? And how do I set that up? Which is actually going to be the next book, which is finding your next for retirement. Because, oh my God, that is an issue for a lot of people. And we've got a huge number of people moving up the pipeline who are facing that in their lives. And when do I, and what does that look like? And how do I define that? But the process, the process of finding your next is clarifying really what's important so that we have the criteria for making decisions. So anyone at any at any point in their life, in their work careers, people who are changing their relationships, um, wanting to change and figure out the kind, how to live, how to design the life they really want to live. I'm a big proponent of we get to design that. But we need to know what's important in order to really set up the criteria to be able to make good choices. Um, that's who should come to the ranch. Coaching is something that I do for people one-on-one. Um, -on -one. It's usually work-focused. A lot of women CEOs, a lot of um, men who are in the the time of their careers where they're stepping into leadership positions and they're really not sure what that means. But honestly, coaching, coaching is an opportunity investment to become the best you can be at what you do. And to have an outside person who's got your best interest in mind guiding you and having conversations about that. Um, so I love what I do. I love what I do. I love having people come here for immersions. I love the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do with individuals as they're moving through their lives and their careers. Um, so I'm open. I um, also limit the number of clients that I take at any given time so that I can give really all of me to my clients at any, at who I have at any given time. So and I have a website. That's a sign of a good coach. Thank you. I have a website called Finding Your Next, crazy, uh, findingyournext.com. The book's on there, the immersion's on there, and the coaching programs are on there. Yep, and, of course, the book is on Amazon for everybody who just prefers The book is on Amazon's Amazon. It's easy, one-click checkout. Outlets, outlets that you can buy a book. It's all out. It's out there. It's out there. And hopefully people will enjoy the stories and the lessons learned. Have you ever thought of recording some of your coaching, whether it's like the just the coaching program or even having a video crew for the immersion stuff to have something else to share? Like, of course, if it was okay with the, with the student or with the... Uh, um, it would be I mean, kind it, of fun it, to do that. I've recorded myself talking about the immersion and we've talked about, you know, there's lots of video about the ranch to help people feel comfortable about coming here and to entice them because it's gorgeous. Um, but no, I haven't ever thought about that, but that would be, that's a great next step in terms of um, really identifying what some of the benefits are and how that flow works. It's a brilliant be idea. a TV right? show. Like I would watch that show. If so like, you know, I could, you could always see the, the trailer for it. Someone come in, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. I've got this opportunity. I feel overwhelmed. Don't worry. I'm going to see Cindy. And then they cut to Cindy and then. Like, you know, you go through that transformation and then people yeah. can, it's similar to the book. It's much more, uh, it's a different process than, than just writing a book. But then you've got a video that people can potentially identify with. You know, it's not going to be for everybody, but it's yeah. a way to kind of archive stories and potentially help people. But, you know, then now you're a, hiring a videographer and a editor and a, a whole crew of, <laughs> it's a whole different like, next. 
<laughs> it's okay. Why not? You know, it's funny though. When one point that just came up in my brain as you were talking is I've had a few people come for immersions who I've given the book to, or they've gotten the book on their own in advance, which then, you know, had them call me. And I had one woman who was here who read the book. And as we were sitting here going through the process in the immersion, like every hour she would look up and go, oh, I couldn't have gotten this one book. And about the third or fourth time she said it, I said, did you, were you worried about that? Were you worried that you made an investment in coming here and you could have just gotten it from the book? And she said, there was a part of me that thought it was all in there. And she said, but I got to tell you, there is nothing that could replace this one-on-one -on -one conversation, this process that you're taking me through. She said, the book gave me this amazing context and I knew, I knew more information about some of the words and the concepts and the process. She said, but it's nothing like going through it with you. Nothing. You know, that one-on-one -on -one is just priceless. It really is. And I understand where she's coming from, where it's like a little apprehension, yeah. like, well, that Sydney wrote everything she knows in this book, right? It's like, well, in theory, yes, but everybody's different. Everybody has, you know, and people identify with different things. Like, I wish there was a book you just hand to somebody and be like, yeah, this is how to do it. Like, there's nothing else to t even talk about. But no, like, you, you can put everything you can't, you, you have into a book, but then you still talk to somebody. They're going to have a unique situation. You're going to give a, you know, unique advice. And you know, that's why there's coaches. Um, yeah. You know, so I yeah. hope people can get stuff from my book and I'm sure you hope people get enough, you know, enough from, from your book, but if they need more, then you've got the option for coaching or it's remote as well as to fully come out and do the immersion. Um, Absolutely. Like that's, you kind of have different tiers for people at different stages as well as different budgets. You know, not everybody can afford to you know, come out and, and spend a weekend at a ranch. And it's access. I mean, you want you want to give people access to the framework that you have. And if they can take the little nuggets out and it works for them, you know, I hope the workbook gives people a different level of working it through personally that, you know, instead of doing sticky notes in the book and writing in the margins, I now am giving people a vehicle and a, a, a space a space in the prompts to really work through the process on their own. Is that going to take away from somebody coming for an immersion? Somebody who wants an immersion and they want the one-on-one, -on -one, it's all about you. They're going to come here and the workbook's not going to be enough. It's, it's, it's not everything is for everybody. You got to provide it at different levels. And publishing allows you to do that, whether you have a, an introductory price point book or an expensive book. I, I'm looking for more people yeah. to write expensive books as someone who has published a $300 book. Um, it is possible. I, I did, most of the time, you're not going to make money off your royalties. However, it is possible if you can justify a higher price point for your book. You know, and those, I think people's higher price books, though, they're like, they're coffee table books. They're gorgeous, you know? It's hard to write you know, personal development book for 300 bucks. I got to tell you that, you know, it's like, uh, I will it's... challenge your thinking on that. I'll Ooh. challenge you. Think of it this way. So we've got Nick's book right here, right? So Nick writes yeah. rise of the reader. Now, if Nick says, Hey, if you buy my book, there's information in there about how you can get a lifetime access to my membership group, as well as a, a one hour phone call with me, uh, like a coaching call with me. Then all of a sudden, depending on, your kind of your level your status you're like you know what i would i would pay three hundred dollars to get a one-on-one a -on -one code phone call with nick or maybe you're a, a business you're trying to do some b2b you're like i've been trying to get a hold of nick forever you mean i can buy his book for 300 bu bucks and i can book a phone call and I okay a form of access that's access, exactly what you said access absolutely that you can i bundle see. access yeah. into so it's a, a book bundled access so really what you're doing is you're, serv you're selling your services using the book as the vehicle for access. You're Throw almost using it just as the checkout. Yeah. Like, hey, I yeah. don't want to set up Stripe. Yeah. Buy it on Amazon. I don't care. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. the, one of the secrets that hasn't been abused yet, thankfully, is royalties are not refundable. Right? Yeah. So like if you buy it and you're, you return it, I still get paid. I don't recommend using that as like a strategy. However, that gets people to relax of thinking, oh, everybody's going to buy it and return it and just rip me off. I'm like, in theory, yes, but in my experience, never happened. Never happened. 
and people trust yeah. the reviews. Like if you're actually good and you're saying, yeah, I have a $300 book with 300 five-star reviews because and it, you got one-on-one -on -one contact with your client. Like, you know, it should be pretty easy yeah. to prompt them for a review at that point. Now it's, it's like, like, look at this. I, like you can do it this way. Now I wouldn't recommend it long-term because the, the, the fees, they're going to take way more in your royalty than you would yeah. if you just sold it on Stripe or PayPal or something. Right. But it is right. kind of a cool thing to be like, wait a minute. That, it's an interesting strategy. There are, I, I hope that more people try out some of the more creative strategies of, yeah. you know, publish a book that includes digital downloads or, you know, graphic yeah. templates, or you can literally bundle anything, put in QR codes, put in calls to action, join my email list, you're going to X, Y, and Z, add more value, and then you can charge more for your book. And then, I mean, I, this was so much fun when I did it. Hey guys, I'm giving away copies of my $300 book. Oh man, did people line up for that? But you know the costs on it. You know, it cost me like six dollars, but I'm yeah. able to give away. And that these are Amazon sellers, so they would actually take my book, turn right around, and sell it on Amazon for cash, right? Like they would actually get the payouts. And they're like, "Thanks, Chris, you like made me all this money." And I'm like, "I'm getting the benefit. It cost me six dollars to now have people ranting and raving about how generous I am." And like, I'll take it. And like, but I mean, I'm a transparent marketer. I try, I like to explain how these things work so that people can say, "Oh, I see how that works. I want to do that." Follow the, yeah. all the steps. And I hope people kind yeah. of take away from the end of this. Like, just like you said, people are paying for more access. The book, no, it comes with no access. It's just paper. If you want to join my group coaching program or my Facebook group or some kind of membership, or you want one on one Zoom calls, or you want to literally come to my house, we can do that. But the price goes up on every little step because you're getting more and more access. And it's, I can't scale myself, right? I can yeah. scale the book, I can scale the yeah. videos, but I can't scale mm -hmm. access. So the prices go up. So someone might see this and be like, I see what Cindy did there. I want to do that and do the exact yeah. same thing. Just follow the model. As long as you provide value, you can like, help people stop being overwhelmed, curate information, share your yeah. personal story in, in a way that like, like, oh, my clients are going through the same thing that I've gone through. Yes, I do have advice for them. Yes, I can help them through that transition. And Absolutely. then use a book as a, as a huge driver for it because published author status it, it means a lot for, the, in my opinion, the foreseeable future. And so I hope a lot of people take advantage of it. I hope so. I'm going to start a good author behind my name. Well, well, Cindy, this was so much fun. Um, I'll this put the show notes where people can find you. Uh, they can find your book. They can find your website. If they're interested in more information. I'm thankful to Nick for, for connecting us on this. Thanks, and uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the last word. Well, I just thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for, you know, this has been fun. I love talking about, you know, anything to do with finding your next and the idea of being on your podcast to talk about it from a different perspective, from the perspective of, look, if you're going to spend the time and the energy and put in the kind of effort that I did put into writing a book like this, then what do you do with it and why? And how do you increase access? I love that. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. It was fun. We'll do it again sometime. I would love All that. Right. Next book. Next F book. F Definitely. F F F F F you have a great Thank you for listening to this episode of the Authorpreneur Podcast. If you'd like more information about this episode's guest, you can find links to their books, websites, and social media profiles in the show notes and video description. If you're an author or business owner who's interested in learning more about how you can use books and published author status to market and grow your business or personal brand, or if you're an aspiring author looking for more information about the publishing process, you can find more information and request an author audit at authorpreneur.com. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, or if you'd like to recommend someone, please reach out via email to chris at authorpreneur.com. Remember, a book is just a book, but when it's your book, it's an asset. Hashtag authorpreneur.